All right, welcome. Today's webinar is going to be about identifying a market for apartment syndication, as you can see here right on the screen. And we are going to be diving in in this webinar about the national apartment syndication reports that you should be subscribing to. Uh, who you should be talking to in the market when you are when you have identified those markets or you are in the process of identifying those markets. Um, how about conduct about conducting a complete market analysis to determine if it is a strong market for apartment syndication, and then a secret but well known metric to easily identify a stable growing market. So I have a, a good little secret there. It's it's a well known metric, but I'm gonna kind of give you a little bit of a background about that uh, piece as well. And then uh, before we get started, I want to mention two things. So first off, I'm Dan Hanford, one of the managing partners of our group called, called PassiveInvesting.com. Um, this is actually our page right here. You can see I was doing some editing earlier, which is why my WordPress thing was up there. Um, let me actually fix this real quick. There we go. And so you can go to PassiveInvesting.com if you're interested in placing some passive um, capital into some of our projects. Uh, you can, on the top right-hand corner of the page, there's a little button that says Join the Passive Investing Club. So you could go there and uh, type your information in there, and my assistant will get on the phone call with you to schedule you to have a conversation with me to make sure that we're the right fit before we actually move forward. We've also added this Knowledge Center. If you just click on Knowledge Center, that actually has some articles in here that we've started to add in here uh, about uh, losing deals invested fine swap until you drop the power of a 1031 exchange our class a asset the smart choice in the 2020 multifamily market so you can certainly go there and uh, do some additional research about our group and also find some articles for those of you who are alive I went ahead and typed into the chat box the passiveinvesting.com if you wanted to actually go there so let me come back to this direction here one last thing and one quick announcement is about the MFI and premium if you're interested in joining us in a little bit on in a paid program at a low cost monthly fee, um, but you'll be able to have access to everything from A to Z around multifamily. We'd love to have you join us there. We also have some exclusive one-on-one -on -one -on -one group calls that we do um, on the, in that program as well. So you can go to mfinpremium.com to find out more information about that. So let's dive into this webinar here. I usually try to have, keep my webinars to about 20 to 25 minutes. Sometimes they go over depending on the number of questions, but um, we will dive as deep as we can into this topic. And for those of you who have joined us in the past, you know that uh, I don't use a lot of PowerPoints. I usually go off my list here that you see on the screen and we'll dive as deep as we can inside of each one of these things. So first off, uh, there's, there are national apartment syndication reports that you should be sub subscribing to. And these reports are, are, are actually extremely important because they allow you to kind of see what the market is telling us and where the market is with these various reports. And I want to try to see if I can pull one of these up for you so you can actually see uh, what one of these looks like. This is kind of an, this is an older report. Um, it's actually from 2018. Um, so let me say, I just found one, so I thought I'd just went and pull it up for you to kind of show you what it looks like. There's uh, a couple of major groups out there, and I'll mention a couple of them. Uh, this one is actually from a group called Marcus and Millichap. So most of you have heard of them before, but here's the report from Marcus and Millichap. It's called the North American Investment Forecast for 2018. Typically, they'll do like a yearly one, and then they'll do one that is actually set for each one of the quarters. They'll have Q1, 2, 3, 4, um, as far as these reports are concerned. But you can see inside of here, they have market overviews for all of these, 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 these major markets. Of course, they have some international locations as well. Um, but that allows you to have a lot of good data in regards to, you know, sales and cap rates and, uh, and you know, new construction and, and, and what is called completions versus net absorption of those new construction units. The vacancies by class, you can use those as well. Um, our group also uses data that's driven from a software program called CoStar. So CoStar actually gives out market reports inside of their software, uh, which allows you to dive deep into these markets as well if you're looking at certain markets. But this is a good way to kind of get started and kind of picking some of these major markets. One of the things before you even start going into these markets is and trying to figure out what, you, what, what, what the market you want to go into, you have to ask yourself first kind of what's What's the criteria that you're looking for? What kind of cap, what kind of you know returns are you looking for? What are kind of some of the, the cap rates that you're looking for to be able to determine, hey, which one do you want to actually settle on, right? And so uh, these are th th this is just an example report that uh, that Marcus and Milchap puts out. Um, but there's there's a couple of the reports that you should be aware of, and one of the best ways to get access to these reports because they are typically free is to contact the, your local broker. Uh, or the broker in a market that you are potentially looking to invest in. 
because they will also give you access to maybe a more in detail, a more in depth and detailed uh, local market report as well. But this is one from Marcus and Millichap. But then you also have your Cushman and Wakefield reports. You have CBRE, Colliers, uh, and then you have JLL. And then there's one other one that I'm thinking of, and I can't think of it right now, but there's, there's several other uh, reports that are like this that are just from major broker brokerage firms. And they are, uh, and, 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 and those, and those, those reports, um, let me actually stop this for just a moment to share, bring it back over here to the screen here. So let's see if I can pull up another one of these reports, try to figure out the name of that other group I was talking about. Uh, there's one from Price Waterhouse Cooper. Um, there's one also from IRR. It's actually not internal rate of return like you might be thinking. It's actually a different group. It's called the Integra Realty Resources Publication. And again, a lot of these reports can be get can be gained and gathered from uh, your local brokers. And I'm not talking about like like, like residential brokers. We're talking about multifamily brokers that are serious about investing inside of multifamily or selling and actually brokering deals inside of multifamily itself. So those are some reports that I would definitely re um, suggest that you subscribe to and make sure you get those things on a regular basis. The next thing is, is who you should be talking to in the market. So in, inside of each one of the markets, some of the best people that you can talk to in the market about how good or strong that market is. And when I say market, I'm also talking about the submarket because the submarket itself is usually where you want to be looking at things because there are certain, like, let's just give an example. Let's just say Atlanta, Georgia, right? There are a, real, a lot of really good, there are a lot of really good uh, submarkets inside of the Atlanta MSA, the Metropolitan Statistical Area, but there are also submarkets that are not so good that you maybe not maybe maybe would not want to invest in, and so you want to make sure that you actually look at that and look at it very closely so you can determine uh, exactly what is in there. And let me see. I had a list of things that I wanted to give you as far as what you should be looking at when you're doing a, a complete market analysis, but who you should be talking to in the market before I dive into that. Well, number one is going to be, you know, the property managers that are in that market, because we have a property management company that we've actually been working with and we can call that property management company, uh, company up and say, Hey, what, what happens, uh, what, you know, what, 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 how is this particular submarket? And they'll say, yeah, I've managed a few properties in that submarket. It's not that good. It's very hard to get, get, get residents there and, and keep at least up above 90% or you know, whatever the case may be. And so you might want to stay away from that type of a submarket, right? And, uh, and we're going to be talking about here in a minute, this well-known metric that is easily, it helps you easily identify a stable growing market. And uh, when we talk about that, it'll make more sense to you to be able to determine, you know, kind of why one submarket might be different than another um, a, a mar submarket that might be even adjacent to that submarket. Um, so those are going to be very important tools and very important things to be able to review um, as well. So a couple of things that I want to give you as far as a list of things that you should be looking at when you're doing a, a complete kind of, you know, market uh, survey or market analysis, number one, you wanna look at the unemployment, the historical unemployment in that market. So I, I suggest going back at least five years and looking at the historical unemployment. And a lot of this data from unemployment and the other things I'm gonna be talking about can be, can be gathered from the census website. So if you just go to census.gov, you can find a lot of data in there in regards to this unemployment. The second thing is, is gonna be population growth. So in the way you find out that population growth is you can either, you know, you know, you, you, I suggest going and getting the, getting the source of the data, which is where a lot of people get their data, is from, uh, is from the actual census.gov website. And you can go in and say, all right, what was the, you know, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19 uh, population? Uh, right. And then you can create a formula inside of your Excel spreadsheet that tells you what, what is uh, and what has been that, uh, uh, that, that population growth. And then you can also look at uh, um, the data of not even, not even just, just because there's two different levels you want to look at. You want to look at it from the MSA level, like the overall market level to kind of get a, a good idea from the overall market, but then diving into that particular sub market that you're only, that you're wanting to be on as well. I know some of you are asking about, you know, what am I looking at and things like that. I just I have a list that I'm just going off of 
Um, but uh, I, I usually don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that. So um, this is going to be something that uh, you'll, you'll have to take notes on to be able to, uh, to dive this in, to dive into this. So I apologize, I, I don't usually have a PowerPoint. So um, with that said, let's, let's continue on here. There was one, I had another question. How current is the census information? So this current census is being done this year. So later this year, it'll be updated. Um, and if you don't have the exact data for right now, uh, you can also go to the, the economic development website for that particular city or that particular MSA. And they'll usually provide that information as well to give you a little bit more up-to-date information in regards to that. Uh, so you can certainly do that as well um, if you're not getting any the most recent information. Um, but they'll usually have like trends or things like that when it comes to it as well. Uh, Teresa, that are property managers the only group that you suggest talking to? So property managers are one of the number one ways that you can find out information. Um, the, there's two other ones that I would suggest, Teresa, and I, I'm, I'm glad you bring this up, um, is no, the number two, you wanna be talking to the, the actual brokers and multifamily in, that mark, in those markets to be able to kind of have an idea as to, as to that particular market. And then the third one is actually, you might find this kind of odd, but uh, real estate agents that are in that market are good people to be able to talk to as well, because they'll, they'll usually know a lot of the, the kind of inner workings of that market and kind of the layout of the land, if you will. And they can tell you about certain areas and things like that, more of that boots on the ground information that you're looking for. Um, your property managers are gonna give you more of the, the property specific type of information about the market and then of course your brokers are going to be uh, of the ones that are going to be giving to you that information about uh, the multifamily market specifics that you're looking for as well let's see are you talking about residential single-family agents yes John I am so talking to local realtors re resident single family for no, I wouldn't say it first but they're just an additional resource that you can talk to and one of the best ways that you can do that is is take them out to lunch you know, take them out to lunch, talk to them about a certain markets that you're looking at, and they can kind of give you, you know, their, their, you know, their, their, their thoughts on that particular market because reports are great. You know, you know, we talked about reports earlier. Reports are great, but really having that, that kind of firsthand experience, that boots on the ground feel um, and, and feedback is really important as well. Let's see, another question coming in here. Let me get rid of these ones. What class of apartment do you look for, A, B, or C? What price points for rent and door purchase do you recommend? So first off, I, our, our group, PassiveInvesting.com, looks for B-plus assets in A areas. And we're not necessarily looking for price, price points for rent or door purchase that we, as far as recommendations. We're primarily looking at the return metrics based on what other what are the types of returns that we could achieve if we go in and do some form of value add play. And so we're not looking at it and just saying, hey, we're only gonna buy things at this price per door or this price of rent or anything like that. Because every market's gonna be a little bit different and every submarket within that market is going to be a little bit different as well. So you have to really look at things on the micro level. And, uh, and when you look at the each, each asset, once you are looking at the assets, that's what you wanna start to, that's when you really wanna start to dive in and say, okay, you know, this, 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 these are the last five traded deals in this submarket. This was this was the price per door, but then also looking at the the rent the rent uh, the rent you know comp analysis there as well, and then also diving in to see you know where um, uh, where is the where is the cap rate and where it are where, where are we going to be able to push the rent and where can we get the cap rate to once we do our renovations. So there's a lot of different moving parts and pieces when it comes to you know uh, that pet piece of it. So when you're identifying a market, I really wouldn't look at it that much, that, 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 at, that, at that kind of a price point. And again, we're primarily talking about apartment syndications. So we're talking about, you know, 100 plus units or more. We're going to be diving in, raising money from other private investors and things like that. If you're looking at things for more on the smaller level where you're going to be buying a property for yourself and it's maybe 12 to 24 to, you know, less than 50 units, you know, my things will be, of course, a little bit different. You can do things a lot differently that way as well. And maybe because of how much money you have set aside, you have to kind of limit, you know, what that price per door is and things like that. Um, but for this particular webinar, that's not what we're diving. We're not diving into that level of it. So we talked about unemployment. We talked about um, uh, population growth. And then we're also going to be talking about the population age. 
So, and what I mean by that is, is, you know, you want to have, uh, you know, an understanding of the, 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 uh, the age of the population, if you will. And so we kind of break it down usually by, you know, 15 to 19 years old, 20 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, and then so forth, 65 plus. We kind of break it down into that little metric. You could break it down however you wish. Um, within uh, the census track, they actually do that as well. Um, they'll break it down into those different uh, age groups. And I went ahead, for those of you who are alive, uh, typed it into the chat box there so you can actually see the kind of age you know, range that the census website uh, breaks it down to you as well. So you can kind of see what the percentage is. Because if you're you know, looking to try to stay in that kind of you know, millennial population that are more mobile people and are usually renters, then you might want to look at the demographics of the age of that population to see is this going to be a great, 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 pro great market to be in based on the population age. And so we look at things as to what the current population is and, of course, the historical population age um, in the past five years as well. The fourth thing that we look at is job diversity. So we want to see in each one of the sectors within the, the market, where are the jobs and how are they weighted? So, and, and again, a lot of this data is got, gathered from census.gov. And you can see, is, it's, is this going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, agricultural, construction industry, manufacturing, wholesale, real retail trade, transportation and warehousing, you know, information, finance, professional, educational services, and uh, you can kind of see some of this data in here as well um, that we actually are, are pulling this information from. So, uh, and again, a lot of these categories are inside of the census.gov website, so you can find that information. And of course, going along the same lines of job diversity, we want to see what are the top 10 um, uh, what are the top 10 employers in that MSA, right? So usually it's going to be like healthcare, government, schools, you know, things like that. Uh, we want to also see, are there any blue chip corporations that are surrounding that market and creating some stability around that market? To give you an example, like Raleigh, North Carolina, um, their, you know, top three employment drivers or employers in that count, in that, in that MSA is going to be like Duke, State of North Carolina, Wake County Schools, and then you have IBM Corporation. That's a pretty large major employer in that market, which we like to be able to see. Um, but then you also have other ones like, you know, Lenovo and, you know, GlaxoSmithKline, and it allows us to see, are there other things that are driving that market and creating some stability in that particular market? So let's just recap real quick again. We talked about unemployment, population, population age or age of the population. Uh, number four is job diversity. And then the, the number five, we talked about the top 10 employers in that market. And then we talked about supply, we're gonna talk about supply and demand, that's number six. And this, this number, this, this supply and demand, there's in this kind of category, we're gonna look at kind of three different things, right? We're gonna look at uh, the, 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 the rental vacancy rate, we're going to be looking at, and that's usually going to be looked at over a five-year period as well, so you can kind of get that, you know, five-year, you know, percentage change. And then you look at, we look at the, um, uh, how many new construction units have been permitted each year over the last five years. Sometimes you don't have five years worth of data when you're looking at it, but at least be able to see in the last 12 to 24 months how many new units of, of apartments ha are actually coming online. These are five plus or more, so nothing below five units. And then we're looking at the median rent, the median rent uh, over the last five years and kind of seeing what that tra trajectory and trend of growth is. And again, I'm talking about all this stuff from the census.gov website. So you can find a lot of this on there um, to be able to you know, dive, in, uh, dive in deep. Now, if you have other software, like we have one called uh, CoStar that allows us to dive into a lot of this software a little bit easier and it's pulling it from census data. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to kind of you know, look at this information, but you just want to make sure that you look at this thing very closely, especially from that supply and demand standpoint. And then, you know, coming up with kind of other kind of, you know, number seven is kind of more uh, a, a little bit more research that you have to do. And it's really kind of like, like, you know, key market information to be able to, 
uh, this, this key market information is really information that you're finding in the market. And the way you find this information is you go to the county's economic development website to find data and information about what are some new jobs that are coming out, coming into the market um, as far as like new employers and new construction that's happening and new, new uh, you know, uh, uh, developments that are happening in that market. So you can kind of see, you know, what the, how, how good that market is. That. Are, are, is money flowing into that market or has money started? to pull back out of that market you know you want to see are there other people that are that are willing to pour money into new development and new construction to see how strong that market is and of course what i like to do at the end when i'm kind of doing this analysis is sit down and look at all this data and come up with like a, a pro and cons list right to kind of see what is what are all the insights that i'm seeing inside of this market that makes me want to dive into that market and not only that makes me want to dive into that market but allows me to be able to say this is a strong market and I can really get behind it and to start to bring in other investors with me into this particular market so that we can actually uh, 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 let these investors know that here's the data we found and this is how strong that market is. So uh, uh, I see another question coming in here. How do you interpret the population age data? What do you prefer? So I, I, it depends because we have, we're in some markets that it's kind of a mix of both millennial and retirees. And so if you're in a more retiree population, you might, you want, you're probably going to want to see more you know, heavily weighted inside of that retiree range at 65 plus, you know, 55, 65 range. But for the most part, in most markets that we're looking at, we want to look for that younger generation, that younger demographic um, that is, is really driving the, the, the rental market, which, you know, for, for, for our purposes, we're looking for that, you know, 20 to 35 year old, you know, range and seeing how many people in that market are actually in that, you know, 25 to 30, you know, you know, year, year old range, because those are the ones that are going to be able to, you know, create some, some stability um, in that market as well. And, you know, a lot of this is really, you know, looking at the data and seeing, hey, does this have strong market dynamics, right? And, and, that's, and that's part of doing that complete market analysis. One of the other things that uh, I wanted to talk about, which is the last thing here, so if you have any questions, uh, please let me know because we're going to dive into this next, dive into your questions next. But the last thing I wanted to talk about is this little, you know, metric, that I, I call it a secret, but a well-known metric to easily identify a stable growing market. We mentioned it earlier, actually, a little bit earlier on, and it's the cap rate, right? It's the cap rate because, and that's the capitalization rate, and, and you know, for, for all, for, for all intents and purposes, we don't use the cap rate as like the end all be all, right? And I know I've been to, you know, several conferences and webinars and things like that where people, you know, tout that you should only buy in an in a eight cap market, right? You should only buy in these, these, these lower end markets. And I would have to disagree with you because for me, if, if you're not looking at the exit in mind and you're not doing the value add play, then I, I would say, yes, go after those higher cap rates. But right now with the current market conditions, in order to get that 8% cap rate market, you're gonna have to go find those, 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 those properties in some tertiary or possibly quaternary markets that maybe no one's ever heard of before. And if you're doing a syndication on that, it's gonna be a whole lot harder for you to be able to raise money for your, from your investors to be able to invest in a market that they've never heard of before, okay? And, and, and even, even markets that maybe they've heard of, but the market dynamics are not there. There's not a lot of incoming jobs. There's not a lot of population growth. It's just kind of stagnant, right? Um, and so you want to make sure that you use that cap rate um, to your advantage. And we, the reason why I say it's kind of a secret but a well-known metric to easily identify a stable growing market is because if a market is actually going up and it's doing it's a strong, stable market, then the actual cap rate will have an inverse relation to that. So the, as, the, as the market and strength goes up, the cap rate will actually go down. And the reason why that happens is because the more competition that you have in a market, the lower that cap rate is going to go. And I know I've, I talk to a lot of people that say, oh, I don't, I don't like to inv invest in Dallas, Fort Worth because there's just too much competition. Well, I'm here to tell you that I would suggest that you only buy in markets that have, have competition. And the reason why is because when you go to exit that property, guess what you want to have? You want to have competition. And so another kind of way to look at this is that if you have competition, then if you're entering a market, say at a 5% cap rate market, the chances of you being able to exit that 5% cap rate or lower are pretty, pretty strong, especially right now, okay? 
And another reason is, is that let's, let's just do, give, you, give you a quick analysis. So if we buy a property in a 5% cap rate market and we do our value add play and we increase the net operating income of that property by $100,000, just to make the math easy, right? We increase that property by $100,000. Well, it, when we go to exit that property, you take that 100,000, you divide it by the cap rate, that 5%, and you've increased the value of that property by $2 million. But if you do it in a 8% cap rate market, you spend that same time, energy, and effort to increase the value of that property by 100,000. In an 8% cap rate market, you take that 100,000 divided by 8%, you've only increased the value of that property by 1.25 million. And I don't know about you, but you know, my time is very valuable and I'm sure yours is as well. And if you can spend the same amount of time, energy, and effort increasing the property to $100,000, if you're in a five cap market, I'd rather make 2 million versus being in an eight cap where I'm only making 1.25. And so that, that's, that's kind of the key thing that I look at and that our group looks at is, 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 is what, how strong is that market? And can we look at that market very deeply by looking at that, that cap rate to see how strong that market is? And so think about the next time you look at those cap rates and go, I'd prefer to buy in a lower cap rate market because it allows us to have a nice exit on the other end. Now, some of you might say, well, if I buy at a 5% cap rate market, I'd probably, when I exit, want to project that I'm going to be getting that like a, you know, a five and a half or a 6%. And that's all great, but I'm still better if I do that in a five cap and go to six versus being in an eight cap market and go to a nine or a 10. Because even if I'm in an eight cap market and I go to a seven, I'm still better off to do that than I am to buy in a five and go to, even if I went to a six, the numbers are still, the, the, the dynamics are still there that make it even a, a juicier and, and more lucrative deal for you. So that's just a, a little secret that I like to look at is, is using that cap rate because you can do it, all the analysis in the world, but the market is going to also dictate how strong a market is. So even if you do all of this analysis and come up with these markets that you want to go in after, you can also just look at the cap rates, right? These cap rates are going to tell you how strong that market is. And it'll also tell you how not so strong that market is as well. Because people who can't, uh, people who can't go into, uh, people who, who, who can't sell their property um, at a lower cap rate, they tend to, tend to increase their cap rate to be able to increase the competition because they have to drive, they have to have more people going into that market to chase the, the higher cap rates in order to be able to, to be able to acquire those properties. So hopefully that was helpful for you. I know a lot of people kind of have this, this understanding that they want to have these high cap rates, um, but uh, uh, it's, it's not, it's, it's actually, <laughs> uh, I have Teresa in here asking, can we plan to discuss cap rates in the future? Yes, we will. So I have right now all of our kind of topics planned out between now and the end of March, but starting in, uh, in April, we'll be having a new, well, I'm putting together some more topics. And so um, I will make sure, Teresa, to include a discussion about cap rates because the cap rates are, are extremely important and they are often misunderstood and can be misleading and people can be scared by lower cap rates. But to me, I prefer lower cap rates. And I'm sure a lot of you probably have never heard that before, but you know, I, I love lower cap rate markets because it tells me how good that market is. So any, any questions as we wrap things up right now, um, as we're going through the rest of, as we as I have gone through the rest of this information, I'm sure maybe you guys, some of you guys are kind of, your wheels are spinning, you're thinking about some of these, some of this discussion that we've had as well. So Dan, I mean, uh, Dan, <laughs> Dominic is asking, how much of the syndication does your partnerships or does your partnership plays in? Um, I'm not really sure exactly that question there, Dominic. Maybe you can uh, do another uh, you know, clarification. I'm not sure if you're asking how many does my partners play into the, into the partnership or you know, how many properties are we acquiring or, or how we uh, actually look at that as well. Uh, Kathleen's asking, did you always uh, like small cap rates even when you were just getting started in the business? And I would say, Kathleen, yes, I have, because in the very beginning, I was always looking at the full cycle of the deal and not just the beginning. Because a lot of people, when they're chasing after these high cap rates, they only look at the beginning price, right? They're only looking at what can they do right now. But I'm looking at it as I was always, I've always looked at it in like a holistic cycle of, you know, I buy an asset, I do the renovations and I sell it. And, uh, and I want to make sure that that's there as well. Let's see. There's a lot of different questions coming in here. Great, great, great suggestions for uh, future ones. 
Do you have hard money in each syndication? Uh, Dominic, yes, that is correct. So uh, when we're acquiring these larger assets that have uh, lower cap rates in order to compete in the current market, we are doing uh, uh, hard money, but not uh, it's not a hard money loan per se. It's actually earnest money deposit that is non-refundable, that is actually card called hard money. And so we do actually do that. So um, we're, with the, with the, we're, our, our group is a little bit of an anomaly, I think, because you know most syndication groups will stay between that you know five to twenty million dollar mark, and our group right now is looking for a thirty to thirty five million and up. So we have right now you know seven different LOIs out, ranging from thirty five million to seventy two million in the, in the properties that we're acquiring. And so we'll we'll put up some pretty big hard money, usually you anywhere know, between uh, you know six hundred thousand and uh, probably closer to one point two, one point three million of earnest money deposit up that will go hard. That's non refundable. Some will go hard day one. Some will go hard after due diligence. Just depends on how that uh, LOI or that contract is actually set up as well. Let's see. What is the lowest population amount in a city or submarket that you uh, would look at? So our my kind of rule of thumb is nothing less than 100,000. So if it's less than 100,000, then I'm not going to look at it. Um, so that's kind of like our, our rule of thumb there, Barry. So good, good question. Teresa's asking, are these practices ideal for units under 100 doors? Yes, they are. You know, these, these types of metrics are good to know, you know, even if you're not going to syndicate it, like if you're just going to buy it, you want to know how strong that market is and how kind of, what are the rent growth? So what are the, 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 the market drivers so that you can know, uh, you know, exactly what you're getting into, right? So these are definitely things that can be had, that can be had even especially the cap rate analysis, right? You know, I, even if I'm buying something myself, even if it was only five units or 12 units, I still want to buy in a low cap rate market because I want to be able to you know, implement my value add play and exit on the other end and then do a 1031 exchange into the next asset. Well, great questions that have come in here, um, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for being here and being so attentive. Uh, now you have a few extra minutes to go to the MFIN premium page and check out the premium program and, uh, and, and dive into that as well. So I uh, went ahead and typed it into the chat box for those of you who are, are, are in here live to go ahead and sign up for that. We'd love to have you be a part of that, uh, that membership program and uh, go to mfinpremium.com to be a part of that membership and, uh, and sign up for our, our, uh, our membership program. And of course, we do all, all of the, we do these intensives that we're doing uh, right now. We're on our first one next month. So make sure you go to multifamilyinvestornation.com slash intensive to find out more information about the intensive that is coming up in, uh, at the end of uh, March. It's, it's, like, it's gonna be March 24th and March 25th. So went ahead and typed the link in there for you so you guys can take a look at that. So thank you so much, I appreciate it. And let me actually see if this is actually gonna work. Oh, good. Um, I didn't know if Melissa was gonna have time to do this because I know she's working on something else for us for today. Um, but here is the next topic for next week. So I will uh, type into the chat box here. Let me actually uh, do this, MFI and webinar. And uh, you can go to this link right now and sign up for the webinar for next week. Go ahead and get a, head, a, a jump start on this. This is gonna be Tuesday of next week. It's gonna be working with investors and securing capital for your multifamily deals. So you can click on that link for those of you who are live. Otherwise, for those of you who want to join us, you can go to multifamilyinvestornation.com slash MFIN webinar to sign up for the next webinar.